Welcome back to Not Your Mama's History. My name is Cheney, and today we're going to be talking about Black historical films with Abby Cox. I'm just so grateful for you. Oh, here it comes. Here comes the Abby. Like, <laughs> I love you so much, and I hope that Mama and Papa and McKnight can hear me profess my love for Cheney. <laughs> remember to actually go see her video and the link is in the description or somewhere around here. Black historical dramas are kind of my thing. I really enjoy watching them. I have experiences from my childhood of watching a great deal of them. Starting with Roots. What's your name? Gunta. Then Amistad, Night John, uh, the story of Miss Jane Pittman. I mean, if you have heard of a Black historical drama, I have probably seen it. When Abby contacted me about doing this film, I was like, of course, yes, let's do this. It's very important to acknowledge that Black historical dramas can be very traumatic to Black viewers and audiences. It's important for people to know exactly what's going to happen before going to the movie theater, and I have had experiences with this before. But do we want to talk about 12 Years a Slave then first, since we're kind of already here? Here's something <laughs> no one knows. You got an exclusive on this. I actually could not see it. Like I went to the theater, mm. I bought a ticket, and during the trailers, I walked out. Why? It was too much. It was already too much for me. I have visceral reactions in these movies and they're very real. And even though um, a lot of these have been traumatized, but for me, it is like reliving a distant memory. When I started this collaboration with Abby, when we were deciding on which films we were going to use, I had very strong feelings about Belle. That was the first one that came to Abby's mind and I was just absolutely not. Yeah. I think it's very problematic. Belle's that, story or like, or that there's only Belle to oh, watch? Oh, oh no. Because we need to talk about Belle too, so. Looking beneath the surface, I would have never been Belle. And, and so I'm sure there are absolutely women out there who identify and would love to be Belle. So that's why we need like more stories. But also for me, Belle is a European story. Yeah, it's there's that a, too. It's a European story. It's a Black story, but it's not an African European story. Mm -hmm. Belle was Black. Her experiences as a Black woman is valid, but she is culturally white European. You must start from the ends, miss. A man taught me. See, Aristocratic so, European right? as well. So, like, <laughs> I constantly have people telling me, oh, I want to look like Belle because like she has a very black African look and I'm like in what world her turban was probably chosen in the in the painting was in the portrait chosen by okay. a white person yeah it was it probably wasn't a choice she decided mm -hmm. on because they wanted to exoticize her I'm so glad now that we did include it for a few reasons, but we'll get to that. But a little bit about Dido Elizabeth Bell, who the story is based off of. Don't be afraid. I'm here to take you to a good life, a life that you were born to. She was born to an enslaved mother and her father, who was a white naval officer, and she was born in the West Indies in 1761. Her father was Sir John Lindsay, and he, from all accounts, he was a career naval officer. Her mother was an enslaved woman in the West Indies, and her name was Maria Bell. We know that her father brought her to England in 1765. The painting we have of her is the only image we have of her face.
There is a passage in her father's obituary about her. It reads here in the London Chronicle. Her amiable disposition and accomplishments have gained her the highest respect from all his lordship's relations and visitants. One of the only other things, uh, passages we have about her day-to-day -day life when she lived with her uncle and aunt and cousin was actually from a dinner guest. And there's a passage about what happened. This is in 1779. A black came in after dinner and sat with the ladies and after coffee walked with the company in the gardens, one of the young ladies having her arm within the other. And so we're just making the assumption that the young lady that the black had her arm looped with was her cousin. Other than that, from her early childhood and adolescence into her teens and early 20s, that's all we have of Dido Elizabeth Bell. I think that for many women of mixed race, they who grew up in white households or even Black people who were adopted and grew up in white households, they can identify with Belle, which is very important. And I'm glad her story was told. Mm -hmm. But the fact that she's continually held up mm -hmm. as this ideal of Black historical drama is mm -hmm. very frustrating to me. Her uncle, Lord Mansfield, he was the Lord Chief Justice. And if uh, for those of you who live in America or in the United States, an equivalent would be a justice on the Supreme Court. He's making decisions that carry precedence. So what lower courts are going to point to. I find it very interesting that they chose the Zong case. I don't think that it made much precedence. It was a very traumatic case in the British public. I wonder if it amounts to more or less than the 30 pounds insurance the traders are asking for each life they murdered. So essentially the Zong was a slave ship that threw a lot of their enslaved human cargo overboard to supposedly save water because they had run out of resources to support them. The insurers basically are like, this seems like fraud. Like you murdered these people so that you could, could get money through fraud. And so they refused to pay. And so the owners of the ship took them to court to actually get their insurance payments. Lord Mansfield, in his decision, looking at his decision, he really was following quite strictly to maritime law. That wasn't surprising to me that he allowed the appeal. It was clearly a fraud case, like they were looking to gain money. This was never a case about if they were human beings or not. So I don't find that this was a very important case. But what was an important case was the Somerset case. I had totally forgotten that it was Lord Mansfield that presided over that case. Oh my goodness, how could they not pick the Somerset case? Mr. James Somerset, who was an enslaved man from Boston, his enslaver, Mr. Stewart, purchased Mr. Somerset. And then after a while, he brought him to England. Mr. Somerset was like, peace, I'm running away. He ran away, he gets caught. His enslaver, Mr. Stewart, decides that he's going to sell him to a plantation in Jamaica. Directly from being captured, he's put on in the hold of a ship to be sent to Jamaica. Thank goodness, Mr. Somerset's godparents who were there for his baptism figure out what's happening and they raise holy hell. They petition, you cannot force someone from England and sell them into slavery elsewhere. In the British colonies, slavery is within the law. It is very much intertwined in the law, but that is not the case for natural law in England or for parliamentary law. Nowhere does it say there's slavery or it holds up anywhere that there's slavery in England. So this is a very big case for uh, precedent. Lord Mansfield actually finds 
in favor of Mr. Som Somerset. And this decision is huge. It basically is held up for decades to come as the case that kind of ended slavery in England. But we do know is that this is one of those big cases that people point to in the history of slavery in England. It basically says slavery is not held up under natural law in England. So to have this case that is like, that hold precedence and it was such a big deal in the period is also a big connection to the American colonies, which I thought would have been interesting to make that connection. A lot of enslaved people in America were looking to that decision and read a lot into it. It also impacted a lot of enslavers in America. And some people point to this as feeding into the worries of American enslavers who are worried that England may eventually end the slave trade and end slavery. I think that this was an amazing case, the Somerset v. Stewart case that they should have used instead of the Zong. I think that this is a very sound um, movie. I really liked it, but I think that we need to start having deeper conversations about um, the Black experiences places, in places. Welcome to Washington, Sullivan. Next up is 12 Years a Slave. This is based off of the book by Solomon Northrup, where he tells his stories of being kidnapped, forcibly enslaved as a free man. And this was from the early 1840s to the early 1850s. I survive! I will not fall into despair! What I really liked about the book is that he had two very different enslavers, and I think it showed different experiences enslaved persons could have in that specific region. I appreciated so much was that they injected how common and nonchalant it was. The whole aspect of slavery. Imagine right now if someone you're walking down the street and someone comes running up to you and they're saying, I've been kidnapped. My name is Abby Cop and I live here. And this is my husband's name and my family's name. Please tell them. And the person's just like, uh, who? Who is? this person's owner and just how blase they were about it, mm -hmm. which also indicated how common it was. His first enslaver was portrayed by Benedict Cumberbatch. And he he did an excellent job portraying it. Uh, his first enslaver's real name was William Ford. He had employed for him one of the worst overseers on earth, Tibbets. God damn you, I thought you knowed something. I did as instructed. William Ford's descendants, his family, was very upset by the portrayal of uh, William Ford in the movie. And having read both the book and watched the movie, Solomon Northrup is very complimentary to William Ford. <laughs> what took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Master Ford. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I actually have a passage from the book where Solomon Northrop talks about William Ford. He says, there never was a more kind, noble, candid Christian man than William Ford. The influences and associations that had always surrounded him blinded him to the inherent wrong at the bottom of the system of slavery. Were all men such as he, slavery would be deprived of more than half his bitterness. I would have to disagree with Solomon Northrup. I also, putting William Ford in the context of enslavers, this was a choice. There was never a more kind, noble, candid Christian man than William Ford. What about all the kind, noble Christian men who didn't own slaves? A true Christian would have said, well, we're gonna, we may have some really hard times ahead of us, but I refuse to own slaves. And this is not putting a modern morality to it. We have people during the period who are saying the same things. 
And so um, Solomon Northrup's feelings about this man were very noble. But one of the things that's very illuminating is this relationship, what happened with his overseer. He said to buy half, I will have flesh and I will have all of it. So the overseer Tibbets tried to kill him by hanging him, harming him and other enslaved persons. Cruel for the sake of being cruel, he was just a butthole. This man was all the butthole. But instead of firing Tibbets for not doing his job properly, he sold Solomon. Now that is why I think we could excuse a lot of things. We could say, oh, slavery just fell in his lap and he didn't know what to do with it. Okay, I'll let you ha hold on to that very implausible theory. But the fact that he chose to keep Tibbets employed and sell Solomon into a worse situation, that says all I need to know. His next enslaver, Edwin Epps, played by Michael Fassbender. Mr. I said, come here! I brought her back just like you. Come here! Whew. In the books, it's very interesting. You see a lot of language like he was in a whipping mood or he was in a dancing mood. And we saw in the movie that when he was in his dancing mood, he made these people who had picked cotton all day from sunup to sundown, he made them dance for his entertainment. Come on, where's your merriment? Move your feet. Actually, I would say his enslaver, uh, Mr. Epps, he was actually worse in the books, if you could believe that he could be worse. Michael Fassbender played him so well. He just looked like a deranged individual. Um, and I think that he portrayed that very well. And then of course, Brad Pitt's character. I will write your letter, sir. And if it brings you your freedom, it will be more than a pleasure. It will have been my duty. Of course, Brad Pitt's gonna write himself as the savior. But I actually want to call Brad Pitt's character, Samuel Bass, as a white savior. And I am the first person to call people white saviors. But I do not believe that Samuel Bass is a white savior. This is why. He put his life on the line to save Solomon. Because if you live in the South, it was at the time the Fugitive Slave Act had passed, technically him going to find his family or someone to save him was not illegal. But we do know that there were people, there were white people who just disappeared in the South. If there were rumors and whispers that they were abolitionists or had any type of sympathies for enslaved persons. And so this man put his life on the line because he could have disappeared into a swamp somewhere and nobody would have ever seen him again. That took a lot of guts. That shows that he put his he put his white male privilege and freedom on the line, his life on the line for this man. That is an ally. That is allyship. Bam. Okay, next up is Harriet. I don't know if you know how extraordinary this is, but you have made it 100 miles to freedom all by yourself. I have very conflicting feelings about Harriet. I just felt there were two different movies going on. There was the one with Harriet, <laughs> which is like an award-winning movie. Wait. And then we had like a minstrel show on the other half. I was like, what am I watching? <laughs> Let me explain this. So we have this movie where we have a depth of characters where we meet Harriet's family, identify with her as a human being and that story was told so well. We have William Stills, who is an actual Black abolitionist. Like, it was such a good story. They were humanized and we could understand their motivation, their dreams and wants and loves. And then we have caricatures of people um, on the other side. To find this thief, 
and burn her at the stake like Joan of Arc. Yes. 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 Right. And I have a plan. The bad guys, the quote unquote bad guys, so the slave catcher as well as the enslavers, they weren't given the same depth of character as the enslaved persons or the abolitionists. And I thought that that was the problem. I think as far as the bounty hunters, slave catchers, let me be very clear. There were absolutely black bounty hunters and mm -hmm. black slave catchers. What I found so abhorrent mm -hmm. about the bounty hunters is that they were a caricature. Mm. And that is why I was so frustrated with it. Mm. And that's one thing I have so annoyed mm -hmm. about the movie mm -hmm. because the bad guys were caricatures. The goal right now is to humanize people yeah. so that we can actually have a real conversation yeah. about how problematic slavery was and really look at enslavers as humans. These mm -hmm. were humans who chose to yeah. enslave people. Yeah, well that's These what the slave did right. Right, these were not boogie monsters. That's what exactly, 12 years a slave, they really humanized this horrible person. Yeah. Um, I think people in general, we have a very hard time in like humanizing people who, who do bad things. Yeah. And that doesn't mean like you humanize them so that you can A, forgive them or humanize them so that you can feel good about letting them off. Absolutely not. Yeah. We need to humanize people so that we can recognize that we can be those people. Absolutely. You and I mm -hmm. could be an enslaver. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's so important that we humanize. So my problem with the Black Bounty Hunters mm -hmm. is that they are, in my head, they are on the same level as caricatures of a minstrel show. I totally see where you're coming from because it's Walter uh, was the one who like had the redemption arc. I think that was his name, Walter. Yes. And, and so it was like he, he was a caricature. It was really awkward. Yeah. And then he all of a sudden becomes a human being. Who the hell are you? Call me whatever you want. That's what you white folks do. I, I really hate how they handled the Underground Railroad. We welcome her to the committee as a conductor on the railroad. There's so many misconceptions about the Underground Railroad. This idea that it was a lot bigger and more organized than it actually was. I find that specifically white people really like a white savior story and it makes them more comfortable to have like, oh yeah, my house was on the Underground Railroad. I would say 80% of the sites I go to that claim they are part of the Underground Railroad because they have a cellar, they were not on the Underground Railroad. My thing is, if all these houses that claim to be a part of the Underground Railroad was, there wouldn't have been slaves. They would have all been able to run away. Also, there's this idea that most runaways had help, when in reality, the majority of people who ran away, they had absolutely no help. And if they had help, it was when they got themselves to the door. So next, one of my favorite all-time movies, The Color Purple. Everything you've done to me, already done to you. I love this book. I love the movie. If you are a Black American, most likely you can quote and have quoted a lot of the scenes. You have to have watched it to understand some blackity black jokes. It's really centered around black women in the 1930s and their experiences in the South. I love it because whenever you see black people in a historical drama, it is all about their interactions with racist white people. And even though there's some of that in it, it's not the focus of the film. And so there, it focuses on these women. First, the main character, Celie. Then we have her sister, Nettie. Apples, apples, A-P-P-L-E-S, apples. 
Then we have Miss Sophia, who is a very strong, outspoken person, portrayed by Oprah Winfrey. All my life I had to fight. Hey, Oprah. Then there's Suge Avery, and Suge Avery love her. This song I'm about to sing is called Miss Celia's Blues. <laughs> and then, of course, Squeak. Abby and I talked a little bit about the controversy around the movie. Obviously the community of women in the color purple, they're the strong ones and the men are the weak characters. And then it made me reflect on the stereotypes around black men and what black men face today, what black men have faced historically. And I didn't know what you thought about like the portrayal of black men within the color purple and how that has affected the black community. How, mm -hmm. like, is it, you know, the stereotypes? It was one of those things like it became very, it was very apparent. Like it's very apparent that every yes, single okay. man in that movie is just is worthless. Wrong. That is such a valid concern. and. For me, considering that the majority of Black historical mm -hmm. dramas that are out there are about strong male characters, mm -hmm. I didn't feel any type of way about it. But okay. I would encourage everyone to actually go read The Color Purple. Having read a lot about Black women during this period, these are valid experiences. If I had written the script, I don't know if I would have put in every deadbeat in one script. <laughs> That's just what I, I just like, you can't find one good black man. That seems yeah. like a personal problem about your life. Like you can't find a good black man. Yeah. <laughs> That's just. You should ask yourself, how many books are there out there about centered on black American women in the South? I'll wait. It's a very important book as well as a movie to get those conversations going. But I don't think that the conversations should stop at Black women in the South. Last but not least, we have Beloved. You got spare rooms? Could stay tonight if you had a mind to. Now, Beloved is a book written by Toni Morrison and it is amazing. One of my favorite books. I was like, I don't know if I'll be able to ever watch this again, but I think that that movie should be required viewing for every adult, ever. It is based off of a story of a mother who runs away with her child, and instead of allowing her child to be taken back into enslavement, she kills her child. Age would have been headed left. I sat and thought to myself, Abby, well, what would you have done? Well, I don't know, but I can totally empathize with that scenario of it's better to be dead than to be enslaved. enslaved. That choice, that impossible choice, the child might, I don't want to say live, you know, but it's like mm -hmm. they will be alive, but at what cost, at what end? Right. Um, and I love these stories because this pops up actually a lot in my research of slavery. We do see this happening quite a bit. We know this and we know it happens because enslavers send letters back and forth asking for advice on how to prevent infanticide. So mothers sometimes would smother their children because they did not want them to be raised in the horrors of slavery. I'd rather see my child dead and free than enslaved and owned by, uh, by these people. So I think as far as her community, I think that there was a level of shame. We don't know how many of those women had murdered their children. Mm -hmm. or mothers who did not murder their children and had to live with the fact that some, a lot of their children mm -hmm. were sold from them. They themselves escaped knowing yeah. that their children are alive in chains, probably somewhere in horrible conditions, and they have to live with themselves in freedom. And so when they see her, I think on some levels, they're angry 
because they may feel like they chose wrong because she knows where her babies are. Her babies are dead and she knows that they're safe. They don't know where their children. So I think there's also that whole very complicated element of community trauma. They stopped me from getting us all there, but you had to be put where you'd be safe. And I did that. I thought it was well done. Beloved, oh, such a good movie. Such a good movie. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember once again that Abby did a video on the same movies, but she focuses in on the clothing history of it all, and it's so good. Please click the link. I'm gonna put the links up also in the description down below. Thank you so much for joining us. Let us know what you think and our perspective of the movies. Keep the conversation going down in the chat below. Also remember to like us and subscribe.